Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Sands live stream for the premiere episode of OSINT Plus. Uh, this series of OSINT type of presentations is going to be one where um, I, Michael Hoffman, come in here with a bunch of different guests, uh, open source intelligence instructors, consultants, and other people, as well as people from other disciplines to help really break down the barriers for what we all do and show that we're really very similar to other disciplines and that we can learn from them and they can learn from us. And I'm very, very thrilled that today for our inaugural episode, I am joined by these three wonderful and talented people. We've got from the OSIN side, Nico Dickens. Say hi to everybody. Hey, hello, everybody. Cool. And on the blue team side, Ryan Nicholson. Hello. How are you? All? And Ismael Valenzuela. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Cool. Welcome. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for coming. I thought it might be a good idea uh, for, for people. I know that Ryan, you and Ismail have some uh, followers that are out there, people that know you from teaching your classes and the other open source initiatives that you have uh, in the blue team world. I thought it might be neat for us to just go around and introduce ourselves so that the blue team audience can get to know Nico and I, and the OSINT audience can get to know you all. And then we could maybe talk about some methodology, maybe talk about some data analysis too, if that's cool. Very cool. Nice. All right. So for those of you that don't know who I am, uh, I'm Michael Hoffman. I am the uh, author of the SEC 487 class here at SANS, the Open Source Intelligence uh, intro uh, Introductory Course. I also am the president of OSINT Curious, and I run an open source intelligence type of consultancy uh, for myself as well. Nico, you want to go ahead and go? Yeah. Well, my name is Nico Dakins. Um, I uh, teach SEC 487. Uh, I'm a co-author oh, of oh. Uh, the beta version of SEC 537 and currently developing another OSINT course for SANS, which will be the 587. So a lot on my plate at this moment in time. <laughs> Cool. Ismail? Very nice. Uh, so Ismail Valenzuela. I'm a science instructor and co-author of Security 530. And uh, I've been, um, I like to say, I've been defending all the things for about 20 years. But we're going to talk more about, about that and the mindset. But yeah, I enjoy what I do. I'm also a senior principal engineer with, uh, with McAfee. And I can, I can talk more about the methodology that you mentioned before later. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. And Ryan, tell us yeah. about yourself. Yeah, I'm Ryan Nicholson. Uh, I've been a blue teamer since about 2005. Primarily, the vast majority of my work has been in the US DOD space as both a civilian and then a contractor. Yes, in that order. Normally, it's the other way around. But now I'm kind of all in with SANS at this point. My day jobs with SANS. I'm an author of SEC 488, the Cloud Security Essentials course, as well as now one of the co-authors of Cyber Defense Net Wars and also taking up authorship duties of the SEC 541 course, which is another cloud course and digging through large data sets and all that cool stuff that we'll get to talk about here in just a bit. That's terrific. You all are very busy people. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to join us over here. Um, so let's go ahead and get started talking about, well, methodology. It It's interesting because within the open source intelligence worlds, and Nico, you know, uh, let me know your thoughts here. Within the OSINT world, many times we focus on grabbing data and just going into a platform and scraping content. But we know that the most successful people have a methodology, have a mindset that they use. And Nico, you've talked about this mindset uh, for OSINT investigators a lot, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I have a blog up on it on Medium. Uh, OSINT is a state of mind uh, where I basically... Um, take the concept of the, the the old school intelligence cycle that a lot of people who are doing cybersecurity may be aware of and basically take that, break that down into um, eight steps, uh, making it a structured methodology. So first think what you need. And with that, you need to think about your operation security and what tools you need, and then grab the information, uh, refine and sort the information 
analyze the information and then sometimes take a step back and collect new information based upon your preliminary analysis, for instance. So okay. that's in short the concept where I, I think see, that I you see. add structure to what you do. And one of the things that I've noticed just in talking with Ismail and Ryan is that some of the things that we do maybe in that preparation step, that scoping and, and planning stage are things that they're doing too. Uh, Ismail, you were telling me and telling us about this think red at act blue thing. Can you tell us more about what that is? I know I, I mentioned it like this, this new thing. It is new to some of us. So can you tell us more about the, uh, that think red act blue and what it means? Yeah. The, the idea is, um, and, it's essentially think red, think as a red teamer, right? Think as an attacker uh, to act blue, to act as a defender. And it's it's something that um, I've been doing my entire life. I, I started in security doing, you know, penetration testing or hacking just because it's, you know, it, it feels like a bit more, more interesting, more sexy if you want. But the reality is that uh, at some point I, I felt that I was, going to add more value um, to organizations and you know to people in general on the blue team side. But I, I realized how coming from that side, from the red side, helped me so much to become, to see things that other blue teamers could not see. And that think red, act blue, it's a mindset, right? It's a philosophy, uh, which I think we, we have uh, many organizations with, you know, going into cybersecurity, they're forgetting about that part. Uh, Nico was talking about the structure methodology, having a goal, uh, knowing what, what is that you're trying to fix here? What's the problem you're trying to fix? That thing red, act blue, to me, it's, it's that philosophy that connects all these, all these dots because attackers, they have a motivation, right? They, they, they have a goal. Well, in, in the blue team world, and Ryan, Ishmael, you tell, uh, please clarify this. In the blue team world, is it always an attacker that you're looking to find, or are there sometimes just investigations of anomalous events that may may be innocuous, or it might be an attacker? You you just are following that path until you get to that evidence, and that evidence then tells you what it is. That that's a good one, and Ryan, feel free to to chime in. Um, I would say that uh, attackers. When we talk about attackers, sometimes we think about the APTs, we think about the you know the nation states, but an attacker could be, uh, you know, an internal, an insider as well. Or, you know, as you said, most of the times it's just finding, you know, something that is anomalous in your environment, which takes you to what is normal in my environment. Uh -huh. And when you think about it, that's, that's pretty much OSINT, right? It's about yeah. discovery. It's about what do I have? Where is it? Uh, can I find, you know, any uh, uh, vulnerabilities or how exposed I am, uh, which is essentially when you you think about it, and this is something I would like to, to, to you know, discuss with you guys as well, is are we actually essentially trying to answer the same questions, but just with different tools or from different approaches? But well, I, I, I think it's a lot of questions that are similar. I, I agree with you. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm just going to extend upon that because uh, a lot of what I find myself doing, again, is trying to, before I can like adequately defend anything, I have to know exactly what I have uh, at my disposal, what my inventory is, what I'm exposing, like Ismail said, where one of the tools I like to run regularly where you're typically thinking red when you're looking at this tool is Shodan. Shodan will easily show you, you know, if, if I have an IP address, for example, on a system that I own that's publicly exposed, what's Shodan tell me about that? What's the attacker seeing on the public internet versus what I see internally? And sometimes that can be very, very alarming. Like, for instance, I might have a public facing web server on this particular IP address where you'd expect things like 443 being exposed, hopefully that's it, right? But then all of a sudden there's this weird like 8443 port that you weren't accounting for. You know, an attacker would find that by using a tool like Shodan and discovering that we, we have this sensitive internal application that's just publicly exposed and we had no idea. You know, we just had bad assumptions at this point. So using those kind of tools can really help out. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that I find over and over again is having that baseline understanding of things outside of Blue Team, outside of OSINT. You know, you could be the best person at doing open source intelligence for uh, Facebook or, or TikTok or social media analysis. But having that broader foundation of either how does the internet work 
or what do systems look like on the internet can be really helpful for getting that extra information. Like you said, from the Shodan.io site, that internet of things search engine that we, we like to use. Um, and also you brought up, and Ishmael too, the understanding of what's normal. Now in the OSINT world, Nico, um, in the in the OSINT world, you know, we have people that are looking for, we have investigators that are looking for people, but we also have investigators that are looking for IPs, for domains, for businesses and all. Nico, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Well, I, I wanted to ask a question to either Ryan or Ishmael. So you both um, uh, talking about that baseline. So basically what is normal. So if you are protecting some kind of infrastructure and uh, what I would be interesting, if you build that infrastructure from scratch up, you would know exactly what is normal or not normal. But what if you were, are, are brought in as a consultant and then you need to take a, a, a look for, hey, what is normal? How can you determine what is normal? Because you have never seen it uh, from the starting point, zero. So you don't know if someone is in your systems beforehand. So how do you use techniques then to detect those things? That's that's a very good that's a very good question. It's one of the most common challenges that blue teamers uh, have uh, these days. Well, first of all, I, I, would, I want to clarify something. When you build something, you should know what normal looks like at some point, at least at the point when you build it and put it into production. Uh, after that, what I find is that a lot of people now they don't have the ability to monitor what is what is going on, right? Now, when when you determine whether something is normal or not. You can't just do that from a technical perspective. You need to also have the business perspective of you know what that system is supposed supposed to be supporting, uh, because otherwise it's like you you may look at the traffic all day long, but is this traffic norm normal or not, right? Um, and that's where I think that Blue Team is fascinating, at least to me, because you uh, I believe the value is in the intersection of you know the business side and and the technical side. Where, where you can say, yeah, you know, this, this type of behavior, let's say, for example, dumping the entire database, it's not normal, right? Look at the volume. Like users are typically going to, you know, look at a few records, but if somebody's dumping the entire database, well, is that normal? Well, what is it going to, right? It's going, oh, it's the backup server. Well, then it might be normal, but it's not the backup server. It's going out to an IP <laughs> that we don't know out there on the internet. Well, definitely that's, that's not something good. Yeah, so and, there's a combination of things. Yeah, and I was just going to say, there's going to be some things that certainly would stick out like a sore thumb. Like you're, you're seeing all this 4444 TCP traffic with this remnant of, you know, like meta, uh, Metasploit, right? Someone using Metasploit within the network or attacking you from the outside. But like Ismail's saying, uh, some things just blend in so, so easily too. Like you know, how do you know if like one day you have 999 hosts, the next day you have 1,000, can you spot the anomalous system? having a good baseline, looking at it regularly, setting up monitoring and detections and alerts for that kind of activity is really where we need to be headed as a blue teamer, which I think can help the BOSYNC community as well, monitoring things over time to help pinpoint just strange anomalous accounts or behavior or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And from our perspective, I think the 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 analogous situation to think red act blue if we can go back to what Ismail was talking about was is really that in our investigations there's usually a reason a point to to the investigations we're looking up a person we're looking up a business we're looking up an ip because there's something that we want to learn about it um very similar to what you do in that you know you're researching i either normal or not normal things you're you're just researching things to to figure out what is this and is it something that's important or is it not? Um, and I think we're doing the same type of thing. Now, for Think Red, Act Blue, is there like a, a methodology to that or is there an overall goal for, the, for, the, um, for your methodology? Uh, for, for me, it's, it's, as I said before, it's a philosophy and it starts with uh, what is the, what is that you're trying to defend against, right? What's the problem you're trying to, to solve? And I think that's a point that many blue teamers are missing uh, they, they're usually like put in front of a console and said, hey, defend everything, right? Yeah. But first of all, you cannot defend everything. <laughs> you have to have a goal. The attackers have a goal. What is your goal? Okay, this is what I'm trying to defend. And again, that's business knowledge, right? Somebody must tell you this is what it's most important for us. Is it our, you know, we need to be PCI compliant. Okay, it's not the most exciting goal, but 
all right, it's something I can work with, <laughs> right? Or we don't want uh, anybody to, you know, to, to, to access this data in an unauthorized fashion, whatever the case is. But then it starts with, okay, let's analyze how the attacker behaves. And, you know, we could be talking about MITRE attack, but I think there's been, there's been many conversations on, on that for, for the last few years. But essentially, it's how do they behave? And let me add something more practical. Like, what are the weapons they use? Hmm. Like Tell me I, more about that. What do you mean? Yeah, if I was to, to defend against uh, any specific adversary, I would, you know, look at, okay, how do they behave? But sometimes, I have to say, people even looking at the MITRE attack matrix, which is awesome, they may feel it's a bit um, theoretical, if you want, right? I mean, we, we know certain things and, and how they're going to be doing it, but it doesn't really mean they're going to be using that in the next attack. But if you focus on the weapons that we know of, I mean, most people is using Cobalt Strike, for example. Can you take an OSINT approach and go out there and find out what are the active uh, Cobalt Strike uh, servers that are listening on the internet? I mean, mm. it's just one scan away, right? And yeah. in fact, uh, I've seen like many practitioners recently just publishing those lists. Like, hey, I've been scanning for Cobalt Strike servers. This is what I found. Now, many of them are going to be maybe, you know, um, companies that set up their own purple teaming exercises or red teaming exercises. But many of those are going to be criminal groups or APTs or maybe even nation states. So that's an a practical application of this think red, act blue. I also call it like follow the weapons, right? What are the weapons? Follow yeah. them and then study them. And, and many of these, you, they're open source. Attackers, they don't always change the code, right? Sometimes they do, but many times maybe they don't. And if you start looking at that code in GitHub, for example, you're gonna find in, in Security 530, we do a, and Brian knows this one, we talk about specific IPv6 attacks that you can do when an attacker is on the network to do uh, fake uh, or spoofed router advertisements. Well, it turns out that if you look at how Metasploit implements that attack, there's specific artifacts that you can focus on and easily implement some detections for, for that on your network. So okay. that's an application of, of that. So I heard a whole bunch of things and I will, uh, I'm not going to, to, I want to reiterate some of that because I know that some of our OSINT audience is more focused on social media and not into technology. So when you are like mm. Cobalt Strike, you know, and port 4444, people are like, what are you talking about? Port, port, what train station is that at? Um, <laughs> the, I, I'm just picturing that. Um, but I mean, some of these technical topics are additional things that we need to learn, uh, especially if you're protecting networks, right? Um, Cobalt Strike is an attack platform. And really, Ismail, what you're saying is you need to look at what people are doing and then almost reverse engineer that, recognize that if they've got some malware inside your system, inside your systems, they're going to be sending something out to a server out on the internet. So look for that using open source intelligence techniques, reverse engineer the malware or whatever the, the, call, the, the thing is inside of the network that you're, yet you found and figure out where it's sending things and then do some research on that. Would that be? Yeah. Awesome? Okay. Yeah. And you know, if I, just to illustrate, uh, to make it easier, right, for the audience, uh, to me, this is just like a, like a chess game. And we know that in this game, attackers always have the first move, right? Uh, so let's let's face it, we are at a, at a disadvantage from the very beginning. So this game should all, all be about anticipating hmm. what that the attacker could do next. And by by analyzing, you know, what's available to you, um, uh, whether it's you know how they have behaved in the past, which we can get from uh, you know threat intelligence reports or by analyzing the weapons they, they have available, right? Because not everybody <laughs> manufactures weapons in this, in this world, and Cobalt Strike is just one more weapon that it's out there. If you learn how they, be, how they work, you could be better equipped or prepared to anticipate what the next move could be. Yeah, also, if I might add something, because I, if I remember correct, a few months ago, the mm -hmm. latest mm -hmm. version of Cobalt Strike was leaked or breached or whatever. Of and, and I like to monitor all kinds of groups and Telegram groups and forums where people are sharing those kinds of pieces of software because then they will be misabused again. So that's maybe an OSINT 
use case where you notice, hey, this is powerful software, but now we need to know who is spreading it, where, for instance, and who is downloading it, which also could imply, I don't know, and that's my probably my unfamiliarity with what you do. How often do you, for instance, set up uh, honeypots to see what kind of techniques they are using to then exploit it with using open source intelligence techniques? Yeah, I've got a good one for that one. Uh, it's an exercise actually I was doing to prepare some demonstrations for the SEC 530 course. Ismail knows I love uh, to do demos as much as possible. Uh, one of them was running uh, what's called an open canary server. It's just uh, you know, the Thinkst Canary. It's a, it's a company that sets up these uh, honeypot systems within your own corporate environments, of course. But they have an open source variant of this that you can play around with. So. I spun one of these up in a, on a, in a cloud server publicly facing the internet. And you can imagine, you know, within minutes, yeah. you're getting all kinds of crazy attacks coming this way. And Hey, Ryan, can, what, you, can, you, can we pause just a second? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell people what a honeypot is? Yeah, so it's just this very attractive looking system, looks vulnerable, it, it's going to be attacked. And that's, that's the point, right? You get a little more intelligence about what could be targeting your system, your environment. And you see a lot of these pop up whenever there's like a big, huge breaking vulnerability out there, uh, you know, enter enterprise grade hardware that's just super vulnerable. They'll set up a honeypot that looks and communicates just like this vulnerable system, but it's not really. It's, it's just going to capture a lot of network traffic and try to show off what the attacker was trying to do to this system. And I did something very similar, but it was even simpler than that. It was just a fake secure shell system that was just uh, being attacked constantly. And Part of this uh, software was capturing things like the usernames and passwords that the attackers were actively using on the internet. Okay. That sure would be a good list to have handy to maybe take this information internally and say, are any of my systems using these usernames? Are they using these passwords? And you can even create like what we call like a naughty list of passwords. If you have a good password solution that you can upload this list and say, if anyone tries to create a password that's one of these, don't let it happen because again, they're real life attackers out there using these credentials. And, you know, we're just a password guess away in a lot of cases from being breached. Yeah, that's really interesting. We talk about using breach data in, in well, in the open source intelligence world. And, um, but that's actually interesting because it's not really breach data. It's data that attackers knowingly use word lists of usernames and passwords that maybe they've gotten from breach data, but maybe they're just word lists, right? Um, that is interesting. Um, that's interesting to think about. Cool. And it's not just about honeypots, right? I mean, if you take that same concept that Ryan described so well, and you take it to, you know, what other other tactical things you can do inside of your network where it's less noisy, right? Okay, like what? For example, like honey tokens. Um, What's a honey token? Think think right out of the blue, right? We know an attacker is going to, once they land on a computer, after, you know, the phishing, the initial attack, what they're going to do? They're going to do discovery, right? They want to find out what you have that might be of interest. And um, so the honey token is the same concept Ryan described, something attractive that an attacker could go after. So what do you think that the attacker can go after? Well, it should have started with uh, acknowledging who would be interested in your organization. Let's say that you have some maybe uh, patient data that could be attractive to somebody that wants to steal it. Well, you could have fake patient data on a file that's called patient data. <laughs> And it could be in a file server. Nobody's going to use it because it's not meant for production. But if somebody touches it, the beautiful thing about it is that there's no false positives. Either somebody's being too curious and have a lot of time in their hands and they're just like, hey, what is, what is this file? Or you have an attacker that is mapping your networks, trying to find where the information is. And uh, I like to describe those as early warning systems. You place them, you place them in the right places. Hmm. And they're going to give you an early indication of a potential breach, right? The breach hasn't happened yet. The attacker is still in the initial phase of the attack. But by using these honey tokens, kind of anticipating what the next move could be and, and well, mitigating a, a, a bigger impact.
So when you were saying things like that, like uh, essentially planting information out there that you were then going to monitor, Nico, I'm thinking of what we would do analogously in the open source intelligence world might use like Google alerts or Talkwalker alerts or something like that to put those alerts out there to see when a, something inside of our organization or some topic that we're interested in gets indexed by Google or by another platform and that or is talked about on a blog or in a social media, then we get that alert coming back to us, but it's not necessarily inside of our network. It's out there on the internet. And similarly, we have to wait until something happens to that data. Somebody steals it or shares it or, or otherwise discusses it. Do you think of anything else like that, Nico, that, that we do? Well, I was more thinking of where um, Ismail said, hey, you may, you may be fished as a company. So they would uh, sometimes, well, let's pray, uh, pray and spray, basically, and they would grab from an entire company all the emails that they could grab using open source intelligence because that's what a lot of attackers will do uh, to get their way in. And then with that, they would send that phishing mail that has an executable or an attachment or something clicky where they can get their way into your systems. But how did they find that information about the employees using open source intelligence. So let, let's dive deeper into that, Nika, because that's a really interesting thing. You know, uh, Ryan was talking about doing the the setting up the honeypot on the network to see what people are sending. But you're saying that before a skilled attacker would even send things over to Ryan's honeypot, they might have a list of ad email addresses or usernames that they think would work on that platform from breach data, from other sources? Where would yeah. you get that? Well, it depends. Uh, first of all, for instance, LinkedIn is a great platform to scrape uh, people working at a certain company. And most of the times they will leave behind their company email address or their private email address. And if with everybody working from home now during pandemic times, well, it's even more easy because now you can target them at their home email address as well as their company email address. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So let me throw it over to the blue team people. Do you all do anything with uh, social media? I mean, think places like LinkedIn looking for uh, leaked data, insider threats or anything like that, where they might be sharing too much information about an organization or is that outside of the realm of, of blue team? So I can tell you what I had done in the past. Again, you could tell me if I'm going down the right path here, because this this sound this, this dips the toes into OSINT just, just a little bit. But mm -hmm. what Nico is saying, like, uh, you know, gathering company email addresses, what's being exposed out there on social media. This also ties into what Ismail was saying about the Think Red, Act Blue. Uh, I, I took that to heart and wanted to take some additional training, like red team training or pen test training, if you will. And part of that training was the reconnaissance phase, of course, like try to get as much information about your targets as you possibly can. And there was, a, of course, a huge uh, you know, that, that, that's where most the most important work is done, at, at least according to this training. And I agree, uh, at least when you're trying to breach these places, right? Having more information certainly couldn't hurt here. But uh, what, back to my long-winded way of asking my question, is running tools like the Harvester, for example, a good idea to regularly run against your own organization to, to kind of see what's out there, see what's on LinkedIn, see what's on Facebook, or if anyone's using MySpace anymore, or, or whatever happens to be out there. <laughs> Uh, Nico, you want to take that? Uh, I guess the, the, the bigger question is, is how do you regularly monitor for information about an organization? What what tools or techniques would you use? Is that ad adequate? Right? That's a much better way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nico, do you want to talk and you want to talk about that or no? Well, not particularly. I just know that the Harvester is a great tool to do that. It's just, well, in essence, for people who do not know, it's a Python script that basically um, asks all kinds of other repositories, for instance, search engines or social media platforms for information that you are giving it C data to. So, for instance, you're saying, hey, I'm interested in sans.org. Now show me all the emails you can find on Google and Bing, as well as on LinkedIn and everything else. And maybe some infrastructure information about IP address and open ports and not all that kind of information. You know, Ryan, uh, so so my hit, my uh, background is in cybersecurity, in penetration test, red teaming, but also I've done, dipped my toes into blue teaming before coming to OSINT. And one of the things that I recognize is no matter what discipline you're in, there are smaller tools and bigger tools. There are tools that are those niche tools that will get you one thing really well, but they don't give you the overall perspective. 
Um, one of the things that I've tried to move to in the OSINT world is show me all of the data that's out there, then I will go through it and decide what's important. And for that, you know, we use, we use some other tools tools like Spiderfoot, which is kind of like Recon NG, if you remember Recon NG from any of the cyber things, but it's web-based, it's got a free version and a, a paid version, and it has over like 200 modules that grabs all of this data about your organization. So you could put your, you could put a domain in there, an email address, multiple email addresses, phone numbers, locations, people's names, and then turn on the modules, add the API keys if you wanted, and then it will grab all of this data from a huge number of sources and present it to you in a nice little email report, which means that you are just consuming another essentially Intel feed or, or feed about your organization that you can then perform the research on. So my thought would be something like that would probably be better than running the harvester. We used to have the harvester in sec 47 and I took it out because it runs as a Python script. It runs against uh, sources like Google and Bing. But if you run the Harvester against Google, and then you just in a set in a browser window, you run Google queries with that same thing. You'll get so many thousands of more hits with a Google query in a web browser than in har the Harvester. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's a different now. Do you also like double check your tools? Um, so for instance, we will we will use multiple search engines when we're doing open source intelligence because we know that Google doesn't have everything and Yandex doesn't have everything. So we, we use multiple things. Do you all like when you're researching something, you use multiple tools, different websites? Yes, uh, but let me, let me go for a second if you don't mind. Like actually, yeah. you said something very important that I think many blue teamers are missing. And it's the mindset, right? That you said, like, oh, that's the best threat intelligence you can have because it's particular to your organization. And I think, Ryan, maybe you will agree with me, right? Still too many organizations out there, you know, asking for give me threat intelligence and, and then buying feeds and getting things that other people have seen, but they mm -hmm. have that they have no context whatsoever, no relationship necessarily with your own business, without mm -hmm. realizing that, as you just said, like, all right, you can use these tools and many of them are free. And just like start with that, start with what would an attacker do, right? First, if they try to find information about your organization and then realize that, as you just said, there's no one tool that will give you everything. Uh, but that's why I think the mindset is very important because when you have the right mindset, you know the questions you want to answer, you can evaluate whether the tools will give you those answers, whether they are partial or full, whether there's overlap, right? And when, the, when there is no tool, you can write your own. And this is what I like uh, about this community, right? That there's always people out there contributing, sometimes with small tools. Uh, but when you know the job, you know what you need to do, uh, everything, everything else is, is easier. Hmm. I like that idea of instead of relying on what other people or other organizations, the, the feeds they have either about what's happening in the world, uh, doing those those assessments of what you are doing and what what's what's well understanding your environment right is is what does the internet have to say about your organization and then taking action on that instead of there's a theoretical thing that might be ha might happen in your organization out here i mean like both you, are important but good yeah let me give you a quick example to make it practical right um Certificate transparency. We, we talk about social media. Well, Facebook has a service where you can, you know, sign up and say, just monitor every time somebody is creating a certificate where my domain is is listed as part of it, right? So mm -hmm. if uh, if somebody would be, you know, if a CA would be uh, certification authority would be uh, uh, breached and somebody's generating certificates for your domains, well. That's obviously something very bad, but you know you would know. But more importantly, again, with the idea of anticipating what attackers could do, could you come up with a list of domains that are similar to your domain that attackers could register and create certificates for them to be used in a potential phishing attack against your organization? And there are actually tools, and we show some of them. Brian knows this in Security 530 which it, it could be like an OSINT thing, but we show it in the blue team context. Like, hey, if you operationalize this, you can generate threat feeds that are contextual to your organization, put them into your SIM, 
and also monitor these certificates through you know certificate transparency. Well, Sorry. and I can add one more thing to that. Uh, Nico, I think you were probably thinking about DNS twist or DNS twister dot report. That's what yeah. I was thinking about. <laughs> exactly. So you, you take that, hey, somebody theoretically could register a an uh, HTTPS certificate or a mail certificate or something like that that's encrypted. But the more likely, the easier thing than compromising a CA, a certificate authority and getting that false cert would be just to register goggle.com with with two G's or whatever, and and just standing up a phishing site or something like that. But yeah, I like that idea of kind of thinking like your attacker, thinking like your target, and then monitoring that stuff, seeing what's out there and getting those custom tailored threat feeds for your own organization. And I've had some students uh, come to me in 530, of course, and just mention that, uh, you know, our, our company has taken that to heart and even went for a step further than that and actually bought up all of those uh, yeah. like, typo, typo squatting domains and homoglyph domains, which for those that aren't familiar, they're like the, uh, the non English looking characters that to a human eyes, they look like an E, for example, but it might be, how can you tell if it's a Cyrillic E versus an English E, right? Well, a computer knows, but your eyes aren't going to know. Yeah. So they would like I said, take it a step further and, you know, 10 bucks a domain, buy up hundreds of them and, you know, removes that threat factor at least for the, the time. Or it reduces it. Or it reduces it, right? Because instead yeah. of having to 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 look at all of the positive results coming back from a thousand domains that look similar to yours, now you only have to look at 200, which is yeah. another something for automation. Yeah, and there's spam filters as well where you can upload those lists and do some prevention here as well so that those phishing emails don't that from those domains don't make it in in the first place reaching your end users. So Ryan, let's talk about that for a second because you deal with large data sets. Um, when you're dealing with large data sets within the blue team world, are there like certain techniques that you're using to test out things for false positives, to remove, remove known goods, to just process the data? Um, because in the OSINT world, we sometimes are analyzing like Nico's monitoring, you know, 30,000 Twitter accounts for propaganda. There's a big data set there. Um, what do you all do, Ryan? So for, for like a reducing false positives perspective, uh, that always leads me into like IDSs. I always think when I hear false positives, I think intrusion detection systems because they really need to be fine tuned. And if you're not doing it, your analysts are they're going to be pulling their hair out looking at, you know, thousands of false positives day in and day out. And, you know, that, that true positive is going to squeak on through. So that leads me into like tuning things. And to do that, you really have to take a step back and like look at what's actually triggering this. Why, why is it not malicious versus this this one would be malicious and and just more fine tune those things and to do that to be honest with a, with a lot of you know just just any large data sets in general there's a lot of uh, slicing and dicing of that with like command line tools for me so very very technical stuff like uh, they, they jokingly call it command line kung fu right so knowing a lot of Linux commands and a lot of additional parsing tools and things like that. Some something a non-technical person would just their eyes would cross <laughs> looking at this, and uh, it, it does take a different mindset to be quite honest, and a lot of experience playing with these tools. But that's the way I go forward with it. But I'd love to hear are there easier ways to doing that because that's that's quite complex, quite technical to, to work your way through for sure. Ishmael, how, what do you all do? Um, for large data sets or the, the bigger feeds, if you will, or whatever. Right. Well, one of the concepts we, we discuss in class is the divide and conquer, right? And uh, which essentially prioritize. And when you realize uh, it, this is a, I think it's a, it's a sickness that we have in this industry, right? We, we come up with new products and we say, oh, you know, IDS is back in the day. Oh, they're awesome. And then IDS yeah. is dead, you know, too much, yeah. it's too many false positives. Then we went through, you know, all everything in the industry. Then, Sim, oh, Sim is awesome. Now, so now Sim is dead because you know it's too noisy. And it's like, well, maybe it's that, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe it's not the technology. Maybe it's that we're putting too much data through these systems, and we're just like we're architecting without a strategy. Hmm. <laughs> so going back to your idea, right? Of hey, we we should have like a methodology to do this. Well, it starts with knowing what you're trying to protect. And for example, with IDSs. I think IDSs are fantastic tools. They take a lot of love and, and care, a lot of tuning, but it helps when you have architected your environment where you know where, where you have uh, you know, critical segments that you need to, to keep an eye on or critical data that you need to keep an eye on. 
And then for those, you know, you can afford to have maybe some false positives. For the rest of your environment that is not that critical, you don't want to have maybe a lot of low fidelity rules. You want to have high fidelity ones. Uh, but that's not the way what the many organizations do it. The way many organizations do it is like, oh, let me buy a product and deploy it all over the place yeah. and then put the guy in front of the console and then you blame the product or the vendor and say, oh, this doesn't work. Yep. And uh, let, let's send every event from every system to the sim. Right. And I mean, it is good to collect all that for you know analysis later on, but it can be very confusing to, to have all that extra data instead of, I guess, planning beforehand what's important to you, which, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about before is in open source intelligence, before we even start doing the Google searching, because we do the fancy Google searching. Um, we, Nico, I think we're gonna have to mention that in every webcast. Um, it, before we start doing the Googling, we have to know what's important to us. What are those keywords? What are those targets? And, um, yeah, I think that's that's important. But, but at some point, as you said, you're going to find yourself with a lot of data. <laughs> so what do you do with it? Yeah, what do you um, do? Well, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of like using open source stuff to get started. And Elasticstack, Kibana dashboards can be useful, like feed your data to one of these and try to do some visualizations. I've been uh, playing a lot lately with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Labs and uh, doing some basic data exploration. Uh, hey, you can put it in Excel. Excel is a great tool as well, right? Yeah. But, um, but just, you know, to learn something new. People that are listening to us want to learn some new useful skills. I think we're going to a world where we're not going to have uh, less data. We're always going to have more. <laughs> so doing, you know, getting some skills related to data uh, analysis and reduction right, of data and exploration, it's, it's useful. Nico, let's talk about you for a second. Well, the work that you do. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I went, I went from personal to work. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Dan, Nico, when you get a huge amount of data, I mean, are, I know that you are a very technical person as well. So something like Elasticsearch and, and Kibana and stuff doesn't phase you, but are you using things like Excel or have you used Excel or, or text editor or something else to... Well, it really data. depends on the use case, right? Well, like Ismail said, if I have a, a data set that lends itself to be analyzed using Excel, I would use Excel. Uh, it right. really depends also on, on speed. Sometimes I need to give an answer before the end of the day, and then Excel won't be sufficient. So I need to drop it in Kibana. But maybe setting up that Kibana instance takes an entire day. So that makes me decide again, hmm, let's stick to Excel. So it really depends on what my goals are. But I, I do see that the demand and need for scaling up and especially doing that link analysis type of things uh, really helps me sift through those larger, larger, larger data. data. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there, I think you brought up a, a great point that that sometimes within the open source intelligence world, as I'd imagine the blue team world, we get uh, smaller, medium sized data sets. You know, you're talking about tens of thousands of records, not millions. And some of those can can be adequately analyzed in some just common tools that we have on our desktops. Uh, but then, you know, one of the, one of the research projects I did was I downloaded all of the GitHub users out there that's like 39 million records and putting that into uh, excel is just not ever ever going to work so i i think there's a small medium and large kind of scaling that we need to do um that's interesting all right cool yeah, I, that reminds me of uh you know again like if you if you're going to monitor the network for example you wouldn't just like capture all the traffic on your network and put it on wireshark not the way you do it. <laughs> yeah. So you start with NetFlow and, and then like, it's like resolution, right? It's like some things you can see them in, in 720, right? Some things you got to see them in full HD. Some things you can, you can afford to see it in 4K, right? With a very detailed granular resolution, but not everything needs to be seen in that. In that yeah. Version. So let's talk a little bit about the things. Um, so one of my goals in, in having these OSINT Plus is to show that you know people in other industries like Blue Team are doing open source intelligence. It's just, you might not call it OSINT. Like Ryan, you mentioned earlier, you know, the red teamers, they call it reconnaissance or recon. So 
can you all tell, and maybe Ryan, you can start and give me a couple, and then Ishmael, you can mention a couple. What are the things that you all are looking up online to get more information about? Um, I, I think actually Ishmael mentioned a few that I call, pretty commonly use, like the certificate transparency logs to, uh, from both a, an offensive and a defensive perspective, for example, because again, that will outline not just when is a certificate being created for my domain? And, you know, if it's outside of, you know, something that I, I know my people did, that's definitely going to be an alert. But also, what am I exposing to attackers? And got to be very careful here, too, because if you're getting certificates, for example, for internal systems that aren't publicly exposed, those could end up in those certificate transparency logs. So if an attacker does breach the perimeter, get into your environment, they now have some more targets that they might find pretty important, pretty critical, right? Because you're not just going to get in a lot of cases, a certificate for just some random system on your network. It, it's primarily going to be prioritized as a more critical system where you, you want more encryption and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then I already mentioned Shodan as well. I use that again for, for both reasons. It's like, what's the attacker see out there on the internet? And then if I'm doing any pen testing, you know, what, what, what are they, you know, showing me right now? If I can just do a quick search on their domain or some IP sample IP addresses that are part of their network block and so on are very so good. You, of course, I'd mentioned the responder too, but or not the harvester, sorry. Can you tell us, uh, so you've mentioned the showdown a couple of times. Can you just yeah. describe what what it is for those those yeah. people that that maybe don't know and, and how you use it? I mean, yeah. at, to some degree. Yeah, yeah. So, so from my understanding, and I'm not a, an expert in like how exactly Shodan's pulling off its work, but I, I, I believe they have a bunch of uh, scanner network scanners scattered throughout the world that 24/7 they're just scanning the entire internet, right? Every port that they, you know, probably more common ports, I would say, more than not. Again, I don't know the details, but anytime they discover something new, they're of course going to have that searchable in their platform. But they're going to go a step beyond that as well and give you. Uh, like version information. Like if I'm connecting to a web server, for example, with a scanner, I'm going to see like that that web server is going to say, hey, I'm an Apache server. I'm running 2.4.29 as my version. And here's my home page. And they'll, they'll have a screen capture of the home page. Or say it's a, a camera, right? You might get a, a still from the camera. You know, you can uh, easily get into some not safe for work type of situations if you're not careful with Shodan. Uh, also some like authentication pages and just just really useful stuff that attackers would definitely want to grab and, it, and they can grab it with ease. I mean, it's it's pretty cheap, I would say, to get a, a Shodan account. I don't know. Again, I don't know the cost right now, but I lucked out and got the a uh, couple years ago over Black Friday. They had a five dollar lifetime membership. So yeah. definitely lucked out there because I haven't done that over the last couple of years. Hopefully they do that again. If anyone from Shodan's listening right now, <laughs> well, and they have that membership. So, so Shodan has free accounts that, and so they have anonymous. Then they have free. You should sign up for a free account because then you can use those powerful mm -hmm. filters that I think Ryan you probably are using to limit the data and all. And then they have the paid membership, and then paid uh, other stuff. Um, so. Am I right that when you use Shodan, you are looking at what's happening within your organization out there? What does Shodan know about your organization that you're trying to protect? Correct. Yeah. So I'd be I'd be gra grabbing 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 things like IP address ranges that are my like my public ranges and doing a bunch of searches in Shodan. Like what what am I exposing? Maybe doing some full text searches of my company name, for example. Maybe it's not my company, but maybe there's references to my company out there. Maybe someone did clone my website and trying to pretend to be my website and, instead of the legitimate one. It, it's at least good to know about that. Maybe inform our customer base to say, you might want to block this cousin domain that looks a lot like our web page, but doesn't happen to be and, and so on. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ryan. How about yeah. you, Ismail? What are some things that, that you're doing out there researching on the internet? So I'm going to give you a couple of other resources that I haven't mentioned. Um, one is, uh, you know, about looking at the the quality of the passwords and what com what credentials could have been compromised already, right? I mean, if we we think about it, the the, the most common exploit today is not an exploit; it's, it's credential theft. Somebody's using that. Yeah. So where can you find those? And there's many. Uh, you probably covered those right in in your OSINT class. I'm pretty sure, like how to find this type of information out there. Uh, but I'm going to say something that's not that obvious. You have the Have I Been Pound, right, from Troy Hunt and many others that you can automate with APIs. But not a lot of people realize that, for example, VirusTotal is an amazing dump of information. 
And mm -hmm. if you uh, have the ability, and I know that that requires some level of access, but if you have the ability to put retro hunt rules in virus total, you can write a very simple Yara rule to search for email addresses. You would be surprised with what you're going to be finding there. Hmm. So I want to do that for my organization. And I, 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 in fact, I will let you know, I have several of those Yara rules running on a regular basis. And sometimes I get an email saying, hey, this was found, at least with my email addresses. And it's, a, it's an early warning that my data, you know, that account has been compromised and that everybody knows my password for that account now. Right. That's so interesting. That's that's one way of doing it. The other thing that I like to do is, uh, and, and this website is, is free, malware traffic analysis from, from Brad. He also collaborates with the um, Internet Storm Center. Really awesome guy. On a daily basis, he's posting about the common malware that we see on a regular, right, uh, in any regular day. So the phishing campaigns that everybody sees, the emotets, the, the trick bots, the, uh, in many cases, the stage one downloader that it's going to open the door for an attacker to do a ransomware attack or any of that so if you if you want to do something useful there every day check it out and then i like to use virus total as well to look at the similarity right so if i know that there's a binary that it's or a script that is doing something malicious what else out there is people seeing that it's similar to that so virus that information but Many other online sandboxes can give you similar information as well. And VirusTotal, I think that capability is one that you would need a paid license to VirusTotal for, or is that free? Yeah, no, I think there's a, they, they have like a 30-day trial now. Okay. But, you know, if, if the organization has also that type of license, they can, they can leverage it. Okay, cool. cool. So, Nico, let's, let's flip this question. What are some things that we do in the OSINT world that would be useful to, or, or, or processes that we do, or um, places that we're looking in the OSINT world that would be helpful to people that are looking to defend a network or research intrusions? Um, I think I did not hear census.io yet. I did hear showden.io, but census is, um, well, in its way, quite similar to showden because it also scans the internet for open ports and infrastructure and things that are connected to the internet. So in, in that way, I think that can give you some extra added value if you end up not being lucky in doing a showden search. Same counts for ZoomI. That's basically the showden for, uh, well, Asia-orientated uh, world, parts of the world. So those things may be interesting and what i think because in essence when i hear uh both ryan and ishmael talk they will end up uh seeing ip addresses often because they are basically entering their systems uh or trying to enter their systems because when right. people operate software they need to leave traces behind so they are knocking on ports they're knocking on doors and with that that's basically a machine fingerprint and an ip address whenever it's well I, I hope that at least these attackers are taking some kind of countermeasures, but there are but definitely are things that we can um, try and reverse lookups, do reverse lookups upon. So IP addresses, mm -hmm. email addresses, but also that digital fingerprint by itself can be a tell, which, uh, well, we train people to have their own digital fingerprint to be, uh, well, somewhat neutral. So you want to blend in and not stand out. But if an attacker has this unique device fingerprint aspect ratio of a screen, certain add-ons installed, if they're doing it through a browser, that by itself can be something that you want to set up alerts for. Absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing with the census.io site. And for those of you that are listening, it's C-E-N-S-Y-S. And one of the reasons goes back to what you were talking about, Ryan and Ismail, about uh, HTTPS certificates. Actually, I'm sorry, encryption certificates. So census.io is scanning the internet not only for IP addresses, but also websites and also HT, uh, encryption certificates. Because some of the encryption certificates that it has cataloged, um, it's breaking out all of the different fields, the CN, the O, the OU, the, the what, how long is it valid for, what IP addresses or domains, subdomains, hosts does, is it useful on? And again, Ryan, going back to what you were saying, simple keyword searches for your organization or the HTTPS certificates that an organization used. Um, I tell a story in my class how 
um, I was asked to find all of the the systems that a certain company used online. And yeah, you can look at the IP addresses that are assigned to them and all. But what about cloud servers? Well, going to census and st and taking some uh, snippet from the official HTTPS certificate from the main website of the company, and then searching for that in other certificates will many times show you, hey, this is hosted on Amazon. This is the DigitalOcean box. And I was able to enumerate like many, many systems that some of the developers or consultants working for a company had company code out on without them even knowing it. Um, but again, it's just keyword searching in a different platform. Um, cool. Yeah, it's pretty pretty neat. Um, also, you know, I think the world of open source intelligence, uh, many of us focus on human, uh, the the people, investigations, uh, who is who is a, taking part in a riot or a protest, who is um, sharing such and such information. But uh, the the many of the tools that we kind of fall back on are tools that help us analyze what's running on a website or information about the websites and and how they're configured uh, at the domain or IP level as well. So um, I think there's a lot of things that we could probably share with uh, you. Build with, for instance, is also something that just popped up in my mind that I think yeah. maybe you guys are also using buildwith.com. Build hmm. If you haven't if you haven't seen the built with site, it's just a free, really nice site. You type in a domain and it tells you everything about a certain system. Very cool. nice. Very nice. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. Every time I talk to Mike, I learn so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking to get smarter too, because uh, being in the world of open source intelligence it is is fascinating to me that all of this data is out there and many times just accessible for free. But what I love learning is from you blue teamers and from other people that we're going to have on the show in the coming months is how you are doing it and what are the what are you looking for and what techniques you're using. Um, so thank maybe you. one day you can tell me how to operationalize and make it useful for blue teams. This website you, you taught me a few years ago, you maybe don't remember it, but uh, it's one of my favorite websites. Which one? This cat does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, we operationalize that all the time. When you have a Facebook profile and you need to upload pictures of your pets or r AI pets. Yeah, that, that's, where, that's where I help. Brian, let's think how we can use those for as honey tokens. <laughs> There we go. Absolutely. Cat tokens. Like <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, we have a lot of sites like that. And actually the AI, the artificial intelligence and machine learning types of sites are getting even better. They are, I think, Nico, you might even uh, might even agree that that they are to us kind of that APT of the 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 cyber attack and defense world is that they are going to be really hard to detect. And to figure out that, you know, this is not, you know, Nico saying a certain thing. It's Micah who created this video of Nico or just a real person. It might not even be a real person. Awesome. Well, we have uh, we've spent this last hour talking with Ryan and Ismail and Nico. And uh, thank you for joining us. I think we probably could uh, could wrap it up. Ryan, do you have anything else you want to talk about? I had one, but I don't think we can cover it in the last couple of minutes unless you want to try. Go ahead. I, uh, right. Well, I'm ready for the lightning round, man. Hey, all right, man. all right. So I was just thinking about a, a particular threat that is really difficult to nail down from the, the just like, like the rogue insider, right? How how could we do better at identifying someone that's going to go rogue before they do it? Like they just suddenly start changing their attitude about our company, for example. They start bashing it on social media, it's, and I don't want to get into lawyer speak or anything because I'm going to be the first to admit I'm not a lawyer here, but. Is there anything a company can do to maybe regularly run an OSINT exercise against their employees to see if you know we, they, they could spot someone who might be more likely to go to go rogue on them someday? So I will caution you. Uh, first yeah. off, uh, there are uh, in some countries there are, are workplace laws that will prohibit companies from investigating their their private lives of their workers. Also, some companies have privacy policies that prevent them from doing that. However, instead of looking at Ryan Nicholson's social media, Ryan A. Nicholson, um, <laughs> I might just look at all the geolocated okay, social media, media that's in the, you know, that's, that's around our building or something like that. Or I'll run queries on, on our company name or on projects that people work on. 
and look at that data coming back. But again, it's 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 understanding what's normal out there and where the places are to look because you running that query on Twitter, then on Facebook, then on Weibo, then on VK is not going to be efficient. So maybe that's another thing. Nico, did you have any ideas before we? Uh, I, I think we could probably have a whole web. We could have an entire that. section about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My main key would be look for the negative uh, keywords surrounding a company. That yeah. will probably get you the most likely hits. Yeah. For. And just and those just, words that uh, emotionally charged people will, will say, you know, they hate and sucks and, and stupid, you know, just those words. If your employee speaks English, if they're using another language, you know, you got to search on those other languages too. Okay. So it sounds, again, not ta talking like a lawyer here, but it sounds like if, if you are led to the person instead of going out and just actively looking at the person, like you find there's negative connotations and it happens to come from a single user's account, it could be a good red flag to, to go off of possibly. At least Absolutely. phone up the lawyer at that time. Absolutely inter interface with your legal team. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, um, I know some well-meaning people that have done some amazing OSINT work that has exceeded what their company has wanted to do as far as legal process and um, and what they they're allowed to do, and they got they had some really you know bad things happen to them even though they were acting in good faith. So, um, yeah, and so I would I would monitor about the organization and about the industry, and then go from there. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Ishmael. Any other thoughts before we log off? I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think uh, this confirms to me that the, the most important thing is the, it's the critical thinking, right? Yeah. It's like when I thought about it, it's like, well, the, the, I think the hardest thing for a blue teamer is to approach an investigation when you approach something unknown to you. And let's face it, you know, no tool is going to, tools can help you but you need to know the, the questions that you want to, to answer, right, as part of that investigation. So I think that uh, I would recommend blue teamers and OSINT uh, professionals to talk to, to extend their, their circle, right, of, uh, of the people that they, they regularly talk, uh, talk to, maybe, you know, attending sessions like the ones you're doing here, um, Mike, at this, you know, on a regular basis, to, to realize that there's a lot of people that might be using, you know, similar or different, different techniques, different tools, to approach similar problems just from a different angle. And I think there's a lot of benefit of, um, for, for us to learn from each other. Absolutely, I think there's a absolutely, and there's absolutely a meshing in the ideologies in the, in the methodologies that we use when we go into investigations. Cause Nico, you've done thousands of, I'll just throw out a number. You've done millions of OSINT investigations where just like Ismail, you know, you don't know where the investigation is going to lead. You don't know who the actors are. Many times you take a, a, a thought, an idea, a location, a person, and you investigate it. Um, so I think there's a lot of overlay there. Nico, any last yeah. thoughts? No. Well, one thing, the W's and one H that always helps. When doing what do you mean? Kind of, well, the who, the what, the when, the where, the how. If you can answer those questions the why. at the same time, why? Yeah, I don't <laughs> do I need to really name them all. So, so, but that really helps you with the critical thinking. So if you have a question, try and answer that question using those W's and one H to at least get pivot points or look or tools that you may now want to pick to find answers to those questions. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ismail. Thank and you. thank you, our uh, live stream listeners. Now, I recognize that there have been some comments that have been coming in on the live stream on the chat. And I thank you for sending those. Um, the conversation here, I really wanted to dive deeper on. So I apologize that we didn't answer every single one of your comments. We tried to weave as many as we could throughout the, the conversation here. Uh, but we are going to be doing these. Uh, I'm going to be doing these OSINT Plus conversations every month on the last Monday of each month. So we have one coming up on April 26th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And there we're gonna be talking about cyber threat intelligence. And we have two amazing people from the cyber threat intelligence world, Katie Nichols and Ted Arthur. And my OSINT companion at th that time will be John Turbush, who has a wealth of information from his private intelligence days and his cyber threat intelligence background. So. Um, make sure to subscribe, make sure to like this video and put some comments in the video on our YouTube platform. And we are happy to uh, take a look at them as well. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ismail. Thank you, Nico, for coming. 
I've enjoyed talking with you this past hour. And thank you to everybody out there in the world that's watching this. So long, everybody.